Let us come together to be still, to be known, to be loved, and to be held by God, our Creator. To be thankful for all that God gives us. To be healed and restored that in our worship today, joy and gladness may refresh and renew us. Let us pray. Lord God, we come humbly into your presence this morning, ready to explore our place in your community. James and John had very set ideas about where they wanted to sit in glory. Sometimes we have very fixed ideas about where we want to sit in this gathering. We like to know our place. Help us to understand that you don't have favorites and we should shouldn't either. And that we are a community. We are all in this together. In your name I pray. Amen. I would ask my brother Ben to come and do the Bible readings. Good morning and praise God today. I hope you're all well and um, yeah, you've been communing with God and just seeking him out. Uh, today's uh, scripture verses are from 2 Samuel chapter 7 and we're going to start by reading number uh, verses 1 to 9. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest over all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelled in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I, have, wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, whom I command to shepherd my people, Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pastures, from tending the flocks, and appointed you ruler over all, over my peoples and Israel. Sorry. And from there we will stay in Second Samuel chapter seven and read uh, sixteen to eighteen. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then the king, David, went in and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? Uh, we'll now move to Mark uh, chapter 10 and read 35 to... 45 and that's about Jesus teaching about serving others then James and John the sons of Zebedee came to him teacher they said we want want you to do for us whatever we ask what do you want me to do for you he asked they replied let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory you do, know, you do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink from or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared. When the, ten, ten heard, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, 
Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Praise God. This is the word of the Lord for this week and uh, it's going to be a good message. So bring open ears. We'll get Johnson back and um, yeah, I can't wait. Thanks, Johnson. This morning I've decided to share with you on the theme, what happens when God says no? What happens when God says no? A shop sells sweets with a sign on the counter that stands at just about eyeball level for the average seven-year-old. The sign says, if mom says no, ask grandma. Within the apparent humor of that single sentence, there are two truths revealed. The first and more evident of the two is that grandparents are soft touch. They look at their children's children and they melt with love and pride. And they pre then pretty much anything that their grandchildren ask for is granted. The second truth is more subtle than the first. The second truth says that something parents must say no. We don't do it to be mean, disagreeable, or to exert our authority. We do it because we love these little ones in our care. And their health and safety depend upon us. So when little Mary asks for chocolate before dinner, we must tell her no. Or when eighth grade Bill asks to go on to an R-rated movie, we must say to him no. All of this is in unwritten job description of parenthood. I want you to consider for a few moments today that God sometimes says no to us for the very same reasons. Not because God is mean or because he wants to exert his authority, but instead because God loves the little ones in his care and our very lives are dependent upon him. Whenever you are on a life's journey today, may you know God stand a touch upon your life. There are days when prayers are answered. In the days when you think they are not. A good prayer would be like, Lord Jesus, we go through life thinking that we know what's good for us. May he interrupt such self-sufficient thought and guide us to those things that are not simply good for us, but those things which are best. In your name we pray. Amen. A couple was celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary with an elaborate party. When the festivities were over, the woman turned to her husband and said, John, you know we have been miserable for 50 years. We fought every day, disagreed on nearly everything. We can't go on like this. And I'm praying God will put us out of our misery. I've made a commitment to pray every day. God will just take one of us on home. And when God answers my prayer, I'm going to live with my sister. Often we think, we know exactly what God ought to say to us. But sometimes the answer is no. In the gospel lesson that is ours today, Jesus continuing on his way to Jerusalem where he would soon die on the cross. But the disciples didn't get it. You see, the disciples never seemed to get it. And maybe that's why two of Jesus' closest friends, James and John by name, felt comfortable approaching the Savior and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do anything we ask for you, of you. Such boldness, self, self-centeredness on the part of these disciples. Lord, we want a blank check. We want what we want and we want it now. This is what they were asking. If our children had said this to us, we would we send them to a time out? But Jesus was so patient with them. What is it exactly? That you want me to do for you? He asked it. And the disciples said, When you come into your kingdom, we want to sit the seats of honor. They did not realize the sacrifice that awaited them just around the corner. The disciples could not see the big picture. So they settled for the narrow one. But Jesus knew better and he told them, You don't know what you are asking, he said. The answer is no. 
I'm sure James and John weren't upset at Jesus for denying the request. But I'm pretty sure that all made sense to them on that first Good Friday when they realized that Jesus was merely protecting them from the future pain. Again, in today's scripture, David had three big no's from God. He got a no about his plans, a no about his purpose in life, and even a no about the practice of his faith. David got a no about his plans after the ark was restored to Jerusalem and peace abounded. King David wanted to build a God, a house, a temple. The king lived in a fine house of cedar, but the ark symbolizing God's presence was still housed in a tent. David felt surely God would want him to rectify that. For David was the most powerful ruler in the world of his day. He was undisputed master from Egypt to Euphrates. He was king of Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem, Amnon, and the Canaanite states. He was ruler by the governors of Edom and the Aramean states, and he was chief of Moab. Certainly, now that David was such a powerful monarch, God would ratify his plans. At first, Nathan the prophet agreed, but later told David, God said no. God can't build me a house. David can't build me a house, said God. I never asked a house for it. I never asked for a house in the past. I don't want one now. The answer, David, is no. And it seems to be that the way with our children as well, as they grow older, they too begin to recognize the value of the way we dis discipline them. And as they have children of their own, we watch them battle with their kids on their same very issues. We fought with them. It is divine retribution at its best. Ultimately, they see the big picture that they could not see as children. Perspective, they say, is everything. No are uh, hard to take, but they are not always the last word. No is not always the last word, and not every no is from God. Life ends as blows simply because we are human beings and live in a fallen world. God has chosen to allow other forces to be at work for a time. If we at work, free choice is operative. An orderly universe means the same water that quenches thirst also drowns us. Not everything that happens in this life is God's will. Not every Christ dream is willful or cried by God. And if we trust the Lord, God will bring some good for someone out of every calamity. But there are times when God says no. For reasons we cannot see, God doesn't rectify our plans. When this happens, God says to us, as to David, as James and John, no. I can't approve your plans, for I have a better plan. That's what God says. So God says no to David's plans. God said no to David's plans in our life. David had expected to be a shepherd. But God said, no, I need you to be a prince. And David didn't understand at that time. He was secure in his father Jesus' house in Bethlehem. His mother, six brothers and two sisters were there. His life seemed set. He was a shepherd and a shepherd he had remained. That was his purpose in life, but everything changed. So things change just because they do, but some, some things change because God says no. Some of us would like to remain children, but God says no, you must grow and live and be behind you one stage of after another. Someone would like to stay adolescents, but God says no, you must be adults and accept responsibility. We would like life to be comfortable and secure, but God says no. Life is made real only by challenge, confidence, and change. God said no, David, you can't be a shepherd. For I have a better purpose for your life. David got a no about his plans, a no about his purpose, and a no about the practice of his faith. David expected the practice of his faith in God by building a magnificent temple. He was prepared to spare no effort, no expense to create a structure looming to the skies for God's glory. 
He wanted to build God a house, but God said, no. I will build you a house, a dynast, and an everlasting throne. That is what God said. So this is a roundabout way of bringing me to the topic of prayer. Those times when we get down on our knees and cry out to God, a demand that sounds strangely similar to that of James and John. God, I want you to do whatever I ask. Sometimes we say that in our prayers. You, my friend, give me that job. Make her love me. Save my marriage. Help me with, win this game. Bring me safe home. Prayers come in all shapes and sizes and degrees of urgency. But essentially, they are all the same. Lord, I want you to do whatever I ask. I prayed those prayers, haven't you? And if they are not wrong prayers, you understand? When we pray, we're doing it what Jesus has invited us to do. But we forget to put in God's hands to say, not my will, but your will be done. That's what we forget. So the fatal flow comes and we wait to see if God will answer those prayers. It seems to me that God always answers prayers. God always answers prayer. But when the answer is one we don't want, we tend to think that's a non-answer. So what's more difficult for you when the answer is no? When there is no answer? Isn't that difficult for you? Now the first way God answers prayer, of course, is with a resounding yes. We all believe that our prayers have been answered. Everybody is believed when God says, yes, you know, yes. Whenever my prayers are answered, I say, you see now, God is faithful. It has happened. But when the no comes, I don't take it. I don't take it. But sometimes God answers as slow in coming. In his book, Winning the Values or in Changing Culture, our author Lays Anderson suggests that one of the ways God answers prayer is by saying, not yet. How many years did I pray for my father to become a Christian? I remember since I became a Christian, I was praying for my father to become a Christian. And only, and only in 2006, my father became a Christian. How many years have others prayed that they could conceive a child? I remember praying for people who were barren. And last week, I received a text message from someone now who got my phone number. Later on, giving a testimony to say, do you remember praying for me over 10 years ago? Now I've got three children, someone who was barren. I couldn't get hold of you because I, I didn't have your number. But someone gave me your number now and what a testimony. How many times do we pray to be healed of their depression? Find a marriage partner. People who are looking for marriage partners, we pray for them. Sometimes we forget about it and later in life we meet them and they are showing us their partners. That's what God does. He says, just wait. Parents have been bringing an issue to God for years without resolution. Same prayer, same pain, same result. Keep praying, friends. Keep laying your request before God's throne so that his not yet may turn into a resounding yes. To do anything less would be doubt the power and the grace of God. Finally, I believe there are times when God says no. We may think God is just sleeping or that he is inattentive to our prayers. But isn't it possible that God has answered our request and that answer is no? And yet that does not make it any easier to accept. We cannot understand why some people's prayers seem to be approved by God and ours are not. You are praying and you see some people are rejoicing and they are saying, God has answered my prayers and yours has not been. And frankly, we don't care about the big picture. When we are desperate, we don't care about the appropriateness of our demand for health or healing or wholeness. We care about this loved one who is the object of our prayer. We want answers. When God's response is no, we cannot understand and we may never know in this life. When someone is hospitalized and we call the prayer chains into action, we often demand that God make the person well and well. But sometimes God says no. In a 
way, it is easier for us to accept that God, God failed to acknowledge our request. After all, he is a busy God with lots of prayer requests to consider. Maybe he never got around to ours. But I cannot believe that God hears every prayer. God hears every prayer. And God can say yes or wait. That's what God can do. Three times in today's text, God told David no. Then David went into the tent of worship. The no three ringing in his ears. What did the king say? You would have stood definitely before God and complained mightily. How could you do this to me, God? That could have David's answer. I'm a powerful man with eight wives and 19 sons. How would you do that? I'm a king, a political and spiritual ruler over your people. And you haven't always been faithful to you, Lord. I've unified the kingdom, prayed and sacrificed at all the right times. I've honored your prophets, even offered to build a temple and get you out of this film's tent. How can you say no to me, God? These were maybe the questions David could have. But David did complain. I like this. David did complain. Hear what? He praised. He sat before the Lord and cried. Who am I, O oh Lord God, that what is my house that thou hast brought me thus far? How can David still believe and praise in the face of God's no? He had learned that is hidden in every no. God is graceful, yes. Yes, David, said God. Though I won't approve your plans, I will give you power to accept mine. That's what God says. Yes, David, though you cannot be a shepherd, I will make you a king. Isn't that great? Yes, David, though you cannot build me a house, I will build you a house, a monarchy, spiritual and eternal. One day, God's only son would rule on that spiritual everlasting throne. That son is God's great yes to all humanity. And that son is Jesus Christ. As God did to David, God may say no to our plans, our purpose, the practice of our faith. But when we ask for Jesus Christ in our lives, we are asking God to give a single ultimate need. God is serving presence with us now and forevermore. And when the, their cry for faith is our prayer, God's answer never, no. But yes, 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 for your promises are yes and amen. I love that song. We have to believe that God knows what is best. We may disagree, but we do accept. I am reminded of something once said by Martin Luther. We must go to the one whom we think is our enemy, and we must trust him. Sometimes when God says no, we think he's now becoming our enemy. But we need to go to him and trust him. God hears and answers according to his holy will. By his spirit, he aligns our prayers and desires to conform to his interest. We must remember that he, like any other good parent, has the right to say no. Only the false and phony gods of religious fiction pretend to be magic genius. We must not treat God so foolishly. We must not treat God or manipulate God in the way that we want. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. James and John said they were willing to face in trial for Christ. Jesus replied that they would be called upon to do so. James died as a martyr and put to death by the sword in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. Verse 2. John lived through many years of persecution before being forced to live the last years of his life in exile on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1 verse 9. Although these two disciples would face great suffering, this too would not mean that Jesus would grant their request for great honor. Jesus would not make that decision. Instead, those places were reserved for those for whom it has been prepared. In conclusion, Jesus didn't ridicule James and John for asking, but he denied their request. We can feel free to ask God for anything, but our request may be denied. God wants us to give us what is best for us, not merely what we want. But David didn't complain. 
he praised God. He said before the Lord and cried, Who am I, O Lord God? And that is my house. And what is my house that thou hast brought me thus far? Isn't that great to hear? A man of great faith, able to trust God even in the face of a no. This is not a sermon about me and my prayers. It's about you and yours in the final analysis. Some of us will bear the name Christian, stand before a loving God who wants the best for every one of his children. What we cannot see, we one day will understand. But for now, trusting the one to whom we pray is the best that we can do. So I just want to urge you, trust in the God. When you receive a no, there is something better for you. For I have the plans for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. That's what God says. And that is my prayer for you today. Thanks be to God. For your promises are yes and amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you that you are God and you continue to help us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your promises are true and never fail. Thank you that Jesus is coming back after the time of Jacob's trouble to claim his rightful position as king of Israel, prince of peace and lord of heaven and earth. Thank you that by faith in him we have been redeemed from the pit and then seated together with Christ in heavenly places. We pray for your people, Israel, that they may come to faith in Christ as Messiah and call on the name of the Lord Jesus for their salvation. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we just want to thank God. It's always when you look at what God has done to you. Maybe some of you have received a no. And you think, no, it doesn't work. And no is not an answer. I want you to relook, to revise, and understand who God is in your life. He is the only one who can shape your life. So whenever we receive a wait, a no, and a yes, we need to continue to praise him. Let us thank God with our offerings, for it is only he, him, who gives us all those things we need in life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with our offerings. May you bless them, Father. Bless our offering, Father, as we bring them to you. It's our way of saying thank you, Lord, for the things you have done to us. We appreciate everything, every moment of our life. We appreciate it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive grace. Thank you, Lord, that we are loved by you. Thank you that you chose us in our weakness and that you hold us in your care. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who took on our brokenness and was himself broken. May we always live in his name. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.